Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that involves a missing child. It's a case where it was thought that she was found years and years later, but there's still so many questions surrounding the entire situation. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you guys think about this case. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Native. Native is one of my absolute favorite sponsors on this channel. I've been using their products for so many years now and they never fail to impress me. I love Native because it's so important to me to be aware of what I'm putting in and on my body. Their deodorants are always aluminum-free, paraben-free, vegan, and cruelty-free with familiar ingredients like coconut oil and shea butter. Native's plastic-free deodorant now comes in new and improved 100% plastic-free earth friendly packaging. Native is committed to sourcing their paper from responsibly managed forests. Plus, for every plastic-free deodorant that you get, you are saving 37 grams of single-use plastic. Using their same amazing formula as their regular deodorant, it still goes on as smooth as butter. It dries very quickly and lasts literally all day. From the time that I wake up and I put my deodorant on right away, take my dog for a walk, and then I have an 11-hour work shift where I'm running around all day and I'm working with children, I still smell fresh by the time I get home. The scents that I have include lavender and rose, which if you are a regular viewer of my channel, you know this is my absolute favorite scent. If I had to pick one scent to wear forever, it would be this one. I am obsessed. I will admit that I am obsessed with lavender and rose. Then I have this lilac and white tea, which is definitely getting up there to be a top contender. It's also a floral smell, but it has a bit of this soapy and fresh smell as well. And then I have cotton and lily, another amazing scent. This one reminds me of like a powdery everyday scent. This scent is one of their sensitive scents, which means that it's made without baking soda. It is still vegan, but I really like to use this one on the days after I shave my armpits because my skin is extra sensitive on those days. I love how many scents Native has to choose from. They now have a new limited edition cabin collection. You can embrace the magic of autumn with Native's new limited fall collections. You can create your own warm, cozy cabin feel with their scents such as warm cider and cinnamon. This is the perfect collection for you fall fanatics. Now, normally three plastic free deodorants go for $39, but if you use my link in my description box below and use code Rachel Shannon. 11, you can get a three pack for only $26, which is 33% off. With my code, you can also get 20% off of their body washes as well as their toothpaste, two other staples in my everyday routine. So again, make sure you use my link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON11 to get your three pack of native deodorant for 33% off. Thank you again so much to Native for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of this channel. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the disappearance of Brittany Renee Williams. Brittany Renee Williams was born to her mother, Rosemarie Thompson, on March 20th, 1993 in Virginia. Now, near the end of Rose's pregnancy, about three months before Brittany was born, Rose had learned that she actually had contracted AIDS. When Brittany was born, it was found out that she too was HIV positive. It was also said that Brittany had a very chaotic lifestyle from the moment she was born. I couldn't find necessarily what the problems were or how Rose came to contracting AIDS. I also don't know who the father is and I don't know if her family knows or if it's just completely unknown, but this is something we will be revisiting later in the video. But either way, Brittany spent the first few years of her life jumping from foster home to foster home. However, I do believe that at some point, Rose, her mother, either had custody of Brittany or she was allowed frequent visitation because at some point, Rose had taken her daughter, Brittany, to a hospital to receive continued treatment for her AIDS. And at the hospital is where they met a woman named Kim Parker. Kim Parker was the owner and operator of a charity called Rainbow Kids. 
Rainbow Kids was an independent foster home operation that Kim was running out of her home where she took in all kinds of children who were dealing with health issues, ranging from AIDS to other developmental disabilities or any other sort of serious medical conditions. She said that she had taken in as many as 50 kids over the years. Now, according to Rose's half-sister, Brenda Martin, Kim sort of pounced on Rose when she met her at the hospital, basically saying that she wants to do whatever it is that she can to help this sweet little girl who is suffering from the effects of this horrible viral disease. By 1996, when Brittany was only three years old, Rose decided to take him up on this offer that she would take care of her. At this point, to put it flatly, Rose was dying. She was succumbing to the effects of her disease and her health was deteriorating. There was no way that she was going to be able to continue taking care of Brittany under those conditions. So with Brittany in Kim's care, Kim was now the beneficiary of Brittany's social security and her Medicaid benefits. And soon after she was put into Kim's care, Rose did pass away. Brittany was only three years old when her mother was taken from her. But either way, through her mother dying and all of these other very difficult things that Brittany had to live with throughout her life, Brenda described Brittany as being a happy child. She was soft-spoken and had the biggest smile that you could ever want to see. By the time she was seven years old, Brittany was very well aware of her illness. Brenda remembered a time where Brittany had dropped a plate and got a cut on her hand, and of course, Brenda had offered to help Brittany, but Brittany said no, that she can't help because of the blood. She said that she would clean up everything herself because she didn't want Brenda coming into contact with her blood and it hurting her. So she was very well aware of her illness and she was very well aware of how it can affect other people. As Brittany and other children were living with Kim in her home, Kim started going to the public to campaign for charity donations to help fund the children that were under her care. She actually told the public that the money donated would be going towards building a wheelchair ramp for her home. So using the money that she got from these charity donations, as well as money that she was getting from the government, she was able to continue caring for the children that were placed with her. However, according to Brenda, she continued visiting Brittany even when she was living with Kim, and she said that the environment that Kim had for the children just was not the best. Brenda said that the outside of the home looked really nice, but the second you got inside, it was just a dump. The place was messy and it wasn't upkept at all. So Kim said that she would use the money from the donations to start making upgrades to her home. In total, she received about $18,000, which she said were going directly towards these renovations. But as you can probably imagine, things were not as good as Kim wanted people on the outside to believe. Authorities had received numerous calls from concerned individuals who said that they suspected that the children under Kim's care were being neglected, abused, or otherwise mistreated. It is reported that social services visited the home many times, and it was said that the house was so dirty that it was almost unlivable. But since then, the records have been sealed and pretty much destroyed, so we don't know what the true records say or what the actual accounts of the environment was. But as far as we know, Brenda reported that the conditions that she had in her home were just unacceptable. Brenda recalls times that this normally very happy and cheerful child was just starting to look sad. She remembers a time where Brittany left her house to go to school and she just looked so sullen and sad as she was getting onto the school bus, which is not something that she was used to. Brittany was usually cheerful and was happy to go to school. Then there came a time in August of 2000 where Brenda received a very shocking call from Kim. Kim told Brenda that she just could not handle taking care of Brittany anymore. She said that Brittany was just flirting with all of the men who would come over and work on the house. 
Kim told Brenda that she was going to be like her mother. She said that she was fed up with it. So Kim told Brenda that if she didn't take Brittany, that she was going to send Brittany with these two other women that she knew in California for them to take care of her. These women were named Kathy Evans and Linda Hodges. At the time, Brenda was shocked. This was completely out of the blue and she needed to figure out what exactly she was going to do. She had three children of her own and she didn't think that she would be able to take care of Brittany. So after consideration, Brenda called Kim back two days later and told her that she definitely could start coming over more and taking care of Brittany more, but she can't fully adopt her because again, she has three other children and she just can't afford another one. But by that point, it didn't even matter because Kim told Brenda that it was too late. She told her that she had already sent Brittany off to live with these two women in California, but she wouldn't give her any further information. Brenda called her repeatedly after this and even showed up to Kim's house, but Kim just would not talk to her. She would not give her any more information about where Brittany was and who she was apparently now living with. That fall, Brittany was not signed up for school, so obviously she was not showing up for school. At that point, police found and charged and arrested Kim for truancy. At the hearing, she told the judge that she was no longer taking care of Brittany because Brittany had moved in with other caretakers. So going off of her word and her word alone, these charges were quickly dropped and she said this whole situation of her being in someone else's care was only temporary. So of course she wanted to keep getting the money for taking care of Brittany. And she said that she was paying these women and that Brittany would be coming back to her care soon. Over the following months, Kim said that Brittany returned home for Christmas. At the time, she said that she paid Linda $3,000 to continue taking care of Brittany. She said that after that, she had mailed Linda $5,000 more. So, a total of $8,000 she claims that she paid to Linda to continue taking care of Brittany. She said that she was, at this point, still expecting Linda and Kathy to return Brittany home at some point, but they never did. And after that Christmas, she said that she had never seen Brittany again. That following year, Kim had been ordered to bring Brittany to the court to do a paternity test. And of course, she did not show up. And once again, Kim was summoned to court to explain this. This time, Kim changed her story just a little bit. And this time she said that Brittany was living with relatives, but she didn't elaborate any further. And as far as we can tell, the courts did not follow up with this. But even though Kim admitted that Brittany was not living with her and was not under her care, she continued receiving $500 per month in government checks and she continued using the money to renovate her home. Now, two years had passed and nobody had seen the now nine-year-old little girl and nobody seemed to care. Not the courts, not the police, and not social services. No one seemed to care. However, there was one news reporter who decided to do a follow-up story on Britney's whereabouts. I do believe this was one of the original reporters who was talking about Britney's disappearance and they wanted some more answers. Kim told the reporter the same thing that she had been telling everybody, but this time the reporter decided to actually do something about it. This reporter finally alerted social services of this situation. Because of Kim's ever-changing stories and the fact that she refused to bring Brittany to the courts or any of the hearings or let them know where she was, social services legally took over guardianship of Brittany and police officially launched a missing persons investigation, which to me is far too late. I don't understand why they didn't do so when she continued to not bring her to the court. If she's living with relatives, if she's living with caretakers, she should still be able to pick her up and bring her to her court dates. It makes absolutely no sense why this took two whole years, but that's what happened. As you can imagine from the very beginning, Kim was completely uncooperative with the investigation. She absolutely refused to tell police where Brittany was or produce her in court to prove her whereabouts 
Because of this, Kim was held in contempt of court for 20 days for refusing to give police the information that they needed to locate Brittany. At this time, Henrico County Police had tracked down the two women that Brittany had reportedly been with in California, Linda Hodges and Kathy Evans. These two women had been volunteers for Rainbow Kids, and they did tell police that they had scheduled a time to meet Brittany and that there was actually a plan in place for them to take care of her. But they said that before the visit, Brittany disappeared, so the visit never happened and they never met Brittany. And obviously, she definitely was not in their care. So, I'm assuming that Kim probably gave them a story, which is why they probably didn't alert police at this time. But after finding out this information that she was nowhere to be found, these two women did join police in their efforts to find Brittany. A new interest in Brittany's case sparked national searches for Brittany. Media outlets were finally spreading the news about this missing child, and they were finally doing their due diligence in searching for her. Quickly after the investigation started, though, police changed the investigation from a missing person into a homicide investigation. At this point, she had been missing for three years. It actually came out that it was Kim's neighbor who was the one who reported Kim to the authorities. The neighbor had reported her twice for suspicion of abusing and or neglecting Brittany. So, police were able to get a search warrant to search Kim's home. They brought cadaver dogs to see if there was any evidence of Brittany's body being there. They also dug up pretty much the entire backyard and her septic tank, but they found nothing there. They also searched through the sewage system that supplied Kim's home as well, but there was nothing there. There was one specific area underneath a concrete slab in the yard that they had a particular interest in and they thought it could have contained Brittany's body, but once again, once they dug it up, there was no evidence of a body anywhere. At this point, she was presumed dead because they made the assumption that she was not receiving her medication for her AIDS for three years now. Without the medication, she definitely would have died by this point. But they found no evidence of her body being anywhere on Kim's property, and they found no evidence that she had been harmed or killed anywhere on the property. By December of 2003, police discovered that Kim had been receiving upwards of $16,000 of federal disability checks that were supposed to go to Brittany, even after Kim admitted that Brittany was no longer in her care. It turned out that rather than using these funds to fix her disgusting, dirty house or better the conditions for the children that were living there, she was just putting the money into her own personal bank account and using the money for her own personal needs and wants. So, she did plead guilty to multiple charges, including social security fraud and fraud that occurred from her misusing the money that was donated to her, and she was sentenced to 10 years in prison. So, basically, at this time, it's thought by a lot of people that Kim was just taking these kids in so that she could cash in their Medicaid benefits, and then instead of using the money for them to take care of the children. She wasn't taking care of them at all. She was just benefiting financially from them living with her and then using the money to fund who knows what. Many people thought that this 10-year sentence was far too harsh because the guidelines for this type of crime is typically 10 to 16 months. But in just my opinion, and this is just me thinking, it's not been proven or stated anywhere, but I do feel like the judge probably knew that she had something to do with Britney's disappearance. The judge probably knew that she was out there neglecting kids and abusing kids and not taking care of them at all, so I feel like the judge probably went hard to just get Kim off of the streets and stop her from hurting anybody else. Linda Hodges, one of the women who Kim claimed had Britney, she didn't think the sentence was long enough. She said, quote, I think she used people, used their hearts. So, for the 20 years that followed, Brittany's case fell out of the public and it became cold. That was until summer of last year of 2021, when a woman came forward claiming that she thought she was this missing little girl. A 28-year-old woman named Kaylin Stevenson from Fort Wayne, Indiana, said that she had been adopted when she was seven years old. She had lived most of her life in Ohio with her adoptive parents before eventually moving to Indiana, 
but of course, she started to get very curious about her own background. She had a very spotty memory of her childhood, but she was determined to figure out exactly where she came from. She said that she had always had the name Williams stuck in the back of her head, but all this time, she didn't know why. She also remembered bits and pieces of her living in Virginia and Ohio growing up, but she never knew why. She said that her adoptive family wouldn't really tell her much of anything about her upbringing before they adopted her. So, due to improvements in DNA tracing and family lineage, Caitlin was able to trace her family origin back to Richmond, Virginia. So, she started looking up different last names, including Williams in the Richmond area, until she came across a missing persons flyer that she saw online. She said that when she saw the photo of Brittany pop up, she immediately recognized the picture as being herself. She said that after recognizing herself, she could barely contain her emotions. She said, quote, I woke up my wife out of sleep and was like, this is me. I know me when I see me. This is me. When her wife looked at the picture of Brittany, she said that she immediately noticed the resemblance. She said that she noticed her hairline, her ears, her smile, and her chin all looking exactly the same to Kaylin. There was even a mole on Brittany's neck that matched Kaylin's, so because of all of this, it seemed like the pieces were suddenly just putting themselves together. Kaylin went on to say that she had vague memories of living in a pink pastel room and she remembered a friendship that she had with a sweet, nonverbal boy who used a wheelchair. She vaguely remembers being in foster care, and again, the title Rainbow Kids sounded very familiar to her. She said that she does remember having a feeding tube growing up, and she has a large round scar on Kaylin's upper abdomen, which matches the scar that you would have if you had a feeding tube. She also had other scars on her stomach from other surgeries that she had as a child, but she couldn't really remember what these surgeries were even for. There were also other scars on the left side of her upper chest, thought to be from catheters, and it was stated on Britney's missing persons poster that she also had scars from catheter placements. So, Kaylin went to the police in hopes that they could open an investigation and help her figure out if she truly is Britney Williams. Now, police knew that Britney did have a half-sister, Anastasia McElroy. Anastasia was actually Rose Thompson's first child, and she too had been adopted, and she still was living in Richmond, Virginia at the time. So, again, Rose Thomas is also Brittany's mother and Anastasia is her half-sister. But at the time, police did not tell Kaylin that Brittany had this half-sister. Now, I don't know exactly how this entire thing played out, but there was a reporter from NBC12 who was able to track down Anastasia and went ahead and talked to her. Again, the reporter did not tell Anastasia that she had a half-sister. Instead, she just showed her a photo of Kaylin and Anastasia said that when she saw the picture, she immediately began crying. She said, the emotion was so powerful, it sort of just took over my entire spiritual being. So, NBC12 connected the two women, and they said that the connection between them was instant. Kaylin said that when the two spoke, they just had this instant sense of familiarity. She knew that Anastasia was her sister. After they met, they grew very close, and they started speaking on on a daily basis, Kaylin said, quote, I was actually ecstatic. She acts like a big sister, a family member that cares, that genuinely cares, and she looks like me, and her kids look like me. So, after meeting, the two decided to get a private DNA test done through LabCorp. This test did confirm that the two have a 95.3% probability of being half-sisters. Then, Kaylin got into contact with one of Brittany's childhood friends, Sarah, the two video chatted, and once again, Sarah thought that she immediately recognized Kaylin as being Brittany. Sarah said, quote, You are such a sweet child. You are so soft-spoken. You have this beautiful smile, like you have right now, the exact same smile. 
I know it's going to be really hard for you, but this is like a new beginning, like everything bad that happened. This is time for your justice. Since their initial meet, like I said, Kaylin and Anastasia have become incredibly close and Kaylin actually started going by the name of Brittany. She basically said that she wanted to get rid of all ties from her adoptive name because it simply isn't her. However, there were a few things that just did not match up that you would expect to match up from someone who was claiming to be Britney. So first, and this is the absolute biggest thing that people point to, is the fact that Kaylin does not have AIDS. This is a lifelong disease. There's no cure for AIDS. The only way to treat it is to manage the symptoms by taking medication so you can prevent further complications. But if you're born with AIDS, you will die with AIDS. You will have AIDS forever. And Kaylin's blood tests are negative for AIDS, so she does not have the disease. It also showed that the birthday on Kaylin's birth certificate does not match the birthday on Brittany's birth certificate. Now, I don't know Kaylin's exact day of birth, but I will say the ages do match. Brittany would be 28 years old at the time that 28-year-old Kaylin came out, so those match, but the actual birth certificates do not match. Now, during this entire thing, Henrico County Police have been doing their own investigation to try to validate these claims. By January of this year, 2022, police came out to say, quote, a robust review of medical records, adoption records, consultation with infectious disease physicians, dozens of interviews, and DNA analysis. They do not believe that Kaylin Stevenson is actually Brittany Williams. When asked about this, Kaylin said that she, quote, did everything out of genuine and honest intentions and only proceeded because of the results that she received from the DNA test. As of right now, Brittany is officially back to being considered a missing person and the searches continue. I also do want to mention that by now, Kim Parker is out of jail and news outlets reached out to her and they even went to her home, but she just went back inside without making any sort of statement, which to me does kind of say a lot because if she knows that Kaylin is not Britney because she knows that something happened to Britney, then of course she's not going to entertain this idea or act excited that Kaylin, you know, or Britney finally came out to say that she's been found. Reporters also reached out to LabCorp for comment, but they didn't hear back. So I think it's safe to say that Kaylin unfortunately is not Britney which to me leads us to the sad reality that after all of this came out that it wasn't her, I haven't seen any more reporting done on her case. I actually found this case after it was posted to a true crime discussion group where the post was basically saying like, isn't it cool that, you know, after 20 years, this missing girl has been found and here she is and she has DNA to prove it, but it's pretty much been confirmed that it's not her. And I saw this post very recently, literally within the past couple of weeks. So long after it came out that this is not Britney. So it's really, really sad to me that pretty much nothing was done to push out this information because now a lot of people think that she's been found and it's pretty much accepted that she's been found. And so people that would be searching for her are no longer searching for her because they think that she's this person. So that is why I want to make this video to make sure that people are still out there and are still searching for Britney and are still trying to find answers as to what happened to her. I do not fault Kaylin at all for this, by the way, because she truly did believe that she was Britney. I truly believe that she came out with the best intentions, truly thinking that she's Britney. I do think she's related to Britney and I do see the similarities in how they look and I think that when she saw this picture of this little girl, she saw someone who looked very similar to how she looks and I think the dots just sort of connected in her head. I think when you are adopted and I'm not adopted so I don't know how the feelings are or you know, what the experience is like but I can imagine that when you're adopted and you don't look like anybody in your family, seeing someone who finally looks like you really, really just must hit differently because you're just not used to that. Your family doesn't look like you. So finally seeing someone that looks like you and then combine that with having no idea about your own background, 
the dots just sort of connected for her and I totally understand that. And I do think that she absolutely thought that after getting this DNA test saying that she is this girl's half-sister, she truly believed that the only possibility now was that she was Britney. So the blame for me goes to the news outlets who did not do their due diligence of correcting the stories or coming out with news stories saying that this is not Britney and we need to keep looking for her. I actually only found one article that goes into any detail that actually confirms it's not her. Almost every article brings up like the sort of questions like saying she doesn't have AIDS and you know the uh, birth certificate doesn't match. So so there's still all these questions, but like, there isn't questions. The police confirmed it is not her. If you were to search Britney's name right now, you're pretty much only going to see titles saying like, woman comes out saying that she's Britney and has DNA to prove it and sensationalized headlines like that, which I think are just so harmful to this case. I can totally see it when it first happened, but it's been almost a year now, not almost a year, but almost a year and people just haven't corrected the stories. So again, people who should be out there looking for Britney just aren't anymore. So I think that a lot of people are misled in this case. So all I ask for you to do is just spread awareness about Britney, let people know that she's still out there and let people know that they still need to be looking for her. Now, there are some theories about all of this as you've probably gathered by now, a lot of people think that Kim is responsible for Britney's disappearance. We all know that Kim is known for having this disgusting, dirty house, as well as having all of these allegations regarding neglect and abuse. To add to all of this, she also lied about where Britney was and refused to tell authorities where she was and she's been missing for 20 years now and she still will not say anything. So I think it's pretty obvious from the jump that Kim knows a lot more than what she is letting on, whether something happened to her and she got hurt and died by accident. Maybe Kim was punishing her and went too far and she died because of that. Or maybe she was just so neglectful and was leaving these kids to their own accord that she ran off or something else happened and she knows that she would be held responsible because she wasn't watching her. The other thing I want to mention is just how disturbing I find it that Kim was saying that Brittany was flirting with the men that were coming into the house. She was literally a seven-year-old little girl. I think that her saying that speaks a lot about her own biases towards Britney. I think that her saying this seven-year-old little child and accusing her of flirting with older men, something is wrong with her psychologically. Whether it's a jealousy thing because Kim thought that Britney was prettier than her and that, you know, she's this pretty little girl and Kim has her own insecurities. I don't know. I think maybe she was being nice to these men who were coming in because she's a child and she seemed happy and outgoing and maybe she just liked saying hi to men that were coming in and doing renovations and she's a little girl so that's what's going to happen. And I think that Kim's own insecurities and her own negative connotations towards her led her to this weird and totally, totally wrong conclusion. Either way, I think this shows that there's something seriously wrong with Kim and the way she thought and the way she treated Britney, so I don't think it's out of the question that Kim could be responsible for harming Britney. However, as we know, no evidence was found in her home or around her home that Britney died there or that she was killed there or that her body was there. Cadaver dogs didn't pick up any scent of her body being there either, but I mean, she had two years. She had two years, man, to clean up everything, to get rid of any evidence, to take Britney somewhere else, put her there, and no one would be the wiser. So I don't put a lot of weight to the fact that no evidence was found because she had two whole years. She's doing renovations on the house anywhere that could have had some evidence on it was probably dug up and gotten rid of right away and renovations were built right over it. So I think that there not being evidence does not really say much of anything to me, especially knowing that she was renovating her house. Any number of things could have happened and it could have been hidden in any number of ways. Now, when it comes to Kaylin, as we see, DNA does not lie. There is a 95% match that Anastasia and her are half sisters. We also know that Anastasia and Brittany are the only daughters of Rose Thomas. So you could come to the conclusion that there's no other way that Kaylin is not Brittany. However, we don't know who the father is. So 
I think that it's very, very likely that maybe they have the same paternal DNA and that is actually why they're half-sisters. It does not necessarily mean that Kaylin is Brittany. Now, police haven't released much more about how they know that Kaylin's not Brittany, but that's my thought on it. I think maybe they have the same father, different mothers. She simply does not remember her childhood because it could have just been traumatic being, you know, having feeding tubes and having catheters and having surgeries. All those things are very traumatic for a child and then being adopted and moving around. Those are all very traumatic. So I'm not discrediting Kaylin's experiences at all. And I think that absolutely can be why she doesn't remember a lot of her childhood before she was with her adopted family because hopefully after that she was treated a little bit better. I don't know, but hopefully... And that could be why she doesn't remember a lot of things. And there's a lot of reasons why she could have the name Williams, because if that's a relative of hers, that makes sense. She could have had a similar foster home situation as Rainbow Kids, and that's why she remembered it that way. Because unfortunately, we know that a lot of foster homes are just not very good. So at the end of the day, I don't think Kaylin is Brittany. I think that maybe they have the same paternal DNA and that that's why the two of them are half sisters. And so I think it's amazing that she found her family. I think it's amazing that she found someone who looks like her, which is, she said, is like a big part of her life is just wanting people that look like her and are her blood family around her. So I'm really happy that she found that, but at the end of the day, we still need to be searching for Brittany. We still need to know what happened to her. Brittany Renee Williams went missing on August 18th, 2000 from Henrico County, Virginia. She was described as a black female with black hair and brown eyes, and she was only seven years old when she went missing, and foul play is suspected. There is an age progression photo of her of what she may have looked like at 24 years old, and right now she would be 29 years old. If you have any information regarding Brittany's disappearance, I urge you to contact the Henrico County Police Department at 804-501-5000. But that is all I have for today's video, and now I'm really looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts. Do you think Brittany is still out there? Do you think Kim Parker did something to her? What do you think about this Kaylin situation? Do you think it's still possible that she could be Brittany even though these other things don't match up? Let me know your thoughts and any other theories that you have in the comments below. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and use my link down below and head to Native and use code RACHELSHANNON11 to get 33% off of your three pack of Native deodorants. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!